I'd like to introduce to you uh, a man that I have just met, but I'm pleased to have met, Mr. John McGuire, who's the Director of Business Education uh, for Gillette College. And uh, we really like it when we get to work with our community college colleagues, so it's uh, nice to uh, um, uh, meet uh, John McGuire and, uh, of course, to see Matt Craig again. He was our speaker, one of our speakers in uh, November. So, um, as I said, uh, Mr. John McGuire is the Director of Business Education for Gillette College, I think new to uh, Gillette College uh, in the fall semester. He teaches classes uh, in international business, entrepreneurship, and finance. Previously, John worked for 10 years on Wall Street for the Bank of New York and the Chase Manhattan Bank, primarily in fixed income capital markets, and he managed a $350 million money market trust fund. It's more money than I've seen, John. From 1993 to 2007, Mr. McGuire was living and working in Russia during the changes taking place from communism to the current, as he puts it, Putin-esque crony capitalism. And there he managed a venture fund and created a company that sold the first American-style modular housing. Mr. McGuire has an MBA from the University of Chicago and a BA in economics from Indiana uh, University in Bloomington. He has also studied uh, at Leningrad State University state in St. Petersburg, Sofia University in Tokyo, Japan, and in Barcelona, Spain. Tonight, He'll share with us his expertise in a presentation entitled, entitled Russia and America's Road to the Bright Future. Please welcome Mr. John McGuire. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Let me tell you about when I met a survivor of the Battle of Stalingrad. Stalingrad, uh, by most historians, is considered the decisive battle of World War II. And uh, World War II, still today, uh, influences pretty much all our political decisions. Uh, you always hear about Hitler, even though it's, you know, happened uh, practically 70 years ago. Hitler is brought up about everything from Ukraine to Syria. And uh, many of our inventions were started uh, at this time. Uh, computers, um, cellular phones, uh, rockets, uh, jet airplanes, even microwave ovens, things like that. So um, it might be a very different world if uh, the Russians had not won the Battle of Stalingrad. Stalingrad uh, today is it's called Volgograd. It's on the lower part of the uh, Volga River. Um, it is, um, it's a very long uh, uh, city. Uh, it's right along the bank. It's somewhere, at the time, it's probably about 30 miles uh, long. It's very thin, only about two miles wide because of the bank. Probably it's about 50 miles today. Um, it was very strategic to Hitler because it was kind of the entranceway to giant oil fields to the east. So that's why he wanted that. And he sent an army of, uh, in, in uh, 1941, in, on August 23rd, 1941, a quarter million uh, member army, a German army, arrived on the doorstep of, uh, of Stalingrad. Uh, the 23rd was called Black Sunday because that day a thousand uh, German planes bombed the city. Um, the Russians had actually expected the attack but they didn't warn the uh, civilians because they were afraid of a, a panic. And uh, because of that, the consequence was about half a million civilians were still in the city during this bombing and 40,000, about 40,000 were killed that day. As you can see, the, uh, the Germans arrived uh, and took virtually all of the city, uh, except for the Russians were, uh, were retreating very obstinately because uh, the leader, Stalin, had given order number 227, which had the famous line, not one step back, Nishagu Nazad. And uh, that is, if you did take a step back, 
without an order, you would be shot. And so they fought very ferociously, and uh, the Germans had basically taken all of the city except for a few pockets just down south toward the, the river, a couple hundred um, yards. And uh, they had taken the top of this uh, hill, which is called Mamaya Kurgan. It's the highest point of the city. And uh, so the Russians were down on by the river, coming up to the side of this hill. And uh, I, could, I, I, I walked over here, if I could show. So this uh, statue is actually one of the largest statues in the whole world. It is the largest statue of a woman in the whole world. Um, and the, so the, the Germans were up above, they were where that city is over there, and the Russians were just in a pocket toward the far left and up this hill. They clung to this hill. And uh, so the battle itself, most of the hottest part of the battle was not actually where this statue is, because that's been landscaped, but just to the, the right here, if I can, yeah, right over here. And I walked over there, and you can still see the trenches. Even after 70 years, the trenches have sort of, you know, rain has flattened us some, but they're very, very clearly. In fact, one of the Russians said, boy, if you want a su uh, su souvenir, just I'll bring a shovel. You just dig down. We'll find uh, metal and maybe a bomb and maybe, uh, and probably bones. And so the, the Russians would cling over there. And it, at that point, when I was standing there, I understood why, after the Germans came all the way, 1,200 miles from Berlin, they could not even go 20 yards further. Because if they could just go 20 yards, they could look down and shoot down on, on everybody. And the Russians clinging there would, would, of course, fight. But what was a key was across the river was the Russian heavy artillery. And every time the Germans peeked over the edge to look down, in came this tremendous artillery barrage right where there and killed everything, German or Russian or everything. And you can imagine, if you were particularly a Russian soldier, how expendable you would feel. My uh, friend, uh, the survivor of uh, the Bottle of Stalingrad, was uh, the mother of uh, one of my friends. And she was a medic. She uh, had her uh, medical supplies. Many of the women, many women were, were medics. They were carrying not only their, their supplies, but also a grenade, because in, just in case they were captured, because they knew that the, they would be raped and killed. And uh, so that was you know, ready for that event. Her job was to be to the far left, basic to the far left. There was a, there is still, uh, the Red October tractor plant, and a plant that was actually designed and built by the Ford Motor Company. And uh, this was the scene of part of the battle uh, back and forth. There was a tremendous, like think of a big auto plant and various buildings and the armies would be going back and forth over the weeks. And uh, my friend's mother, whose name is uh, Natasha Ardashova, uh, her job was to be at a collection point for the wounded over by that uh, tractor factory. And so every day they would bring in the wounded and they would try to keep them uh, as, uh, as best they could, treat them as best they could. But they had to wait till night because the Germans had command of the air. And so every night they would get and take the wounded to the river and take them across the river to the hospitals there and then bring back reinforcements to come back up and fill the lines again at the, at this, the side of this hill and backwards. And that went on from uh, August until uh, February. And so uh, she was one time, one day, that they uh, had collected, uh, were ready to truck for, uh, with the wounded. And she was in the back, you know, treating or tending to the wounded. And they started rolling down toward the river. And they were attacked by a German uh, fighter plane that strafed the, uh, the truck. And uh, she was 88 years old when she told me this. She said, I saw the bullets coming through the, the uh, canvas flaps of the truck. And then there was a, an explosion. And when I woke up, everything was destroyed around me. All seven men that were there was, were killed. And yet I sat there with not a scratch.
the battle uh, there, just to, uh, that, that battle cost a million lives. I think it's sort of hard for Americans to uh, fathom that. That one battle was more, more than two times the uh, killed uh, as all the American dead for World War II. One battle. And that wasn't the only battle. There were, three, there were two more of that size, and there were probably about 10 that are larger than the largest battle uh, casualties that we had during the war. And yet, as you know, you've probably seen a lot of the, there's movies, Saving Private Ryan, um, D-Day, The Battle of the Bulge. Um, we have a lot of media telling us about our own heroism and the struggle that we had during the war. But, uh, I mean, just imagine. Um, this, this was another uh, million uh, killed uh, area. This was the uh, battle, the blockade of Leningrad, which is now called St. Petersburg. Um, probably, well, <clears throat> there's the story, everyone in Russia knows the story of Tanya Savicheva. Uh, Tanya was uh, uh, and part of the, the real, probably the greatest urban tragedy in the last century, where a city of a million and a half people were blockaded under siege, okay, and uh, a half a million people in that first uh, year died of starvation. And that happened in, the, you know, in living memory. Uh, Tanya had, you know, uh, wrote, started writing a, dry, a diary about the same time that Anne Frank. It was similar, she was 12 years old. And uh, uh, well, I mean, what do you do in a major city when it's all cut off? And uh, what, how, where do you find something to eat? What do, can you get to eat? Or when the electricity in a, in a well, it's similar, similar here to here. If the electricity is all cut off and you have no way to get oil or coal or, you know, the last fence has been burned, how do you stay warm? So uh, Tanya faithfully recorded over the time uh, in her diary. And so first her, uh, her uh, brother died, Genya, and then two uncles died. Then her, uh, her uh, grandmother died. Uh, then her mother, um, and uh, then her brother, and then she wrote, uh, they're all dead. I'm alone. Uh, north of Moscow is another major, this is where the, the Germans were finally stopped. They had blitzkrieg and taken over France. And uh, they had never been stopped. No one had ever could, could figure out what to do. And yet, uh, the Battle of Moscow went for two years, basically. A million and a half ca killed during that time. And um, north of Moscow, near Sheremetyevo Airport, the main uh, international airport, is uh, a, a town called Istra. And Istra is n most known for having an ancient monastery there, a very beautiful monastery. And nearby there, um, one, t one time my girlfriend and I took a break. We lived in the center of Moscow and we decided to go out to Istra where there's a kind of a budget resort. And there's many of these budget resorts all over the country. Under communism, everyone would get vouchers so that they could regularly go out of their cities, get out of their apartments and, you know, go skiing or go swimming if they, during the season or simply walk in the woods. And so we went to this uh, budget um, uh, resort place, uh, just a little ways outside Moscow, north. And uh, one time we were walking um, along a, a country road near there, and I came upon this uh, monument. And there's a lot of this design. This monument is a lot of places. It's a very common design. But it was kind of broken down, and uh, I, at first I didn't know what it was <laughs> until I walked up and I read the inscriptions. And the inscription said that there were 23 men, unknown, buried in a common grave underneath this. And I you know, could look around and I could see that apparently, you know, there was so much uh, of a battle and so much movement back and forth, counterattacks and attacks, there wasn't time to take, you know, to check the dental records or uh, they usually carried, instead of metal dog, dog tags, they would have a, a, a wooden capsule with their private in, uh, information inside. But apparently this was somehow lost. Or, and, and so they just had to bury 
the bodies as they went, as they moved along. And this was one of those places, and there are, there are many of them. And then later, in 1945 or after, they put place a monument on this, uh, on these pla this place. And uh, it usually it says, the, you know, these words, never to be forgotten. But I can tell you from seeing this kind of ramshackle uh, monument that um, it can be forgotten. People can be forgotten, especially, and, and, and uh, uh, eternal flames will die out if uh, they're not replenished. Well, how the heck is this country that, uh, that all this, you know, the stuff in the news and all this history is about? Well, it's, uh, uh, it's over in Northern Europe and Asia. It's uh, where we have four time zones. They have 11 time zones. It's about one, they have about one quarter of the entire landmass of uh, the world. And it's mostly Northern. It's basically, if you watch the Olympics, uh, you know that it's not all Northern. It's actually got Sochi, where the Olympics was, is more like Tennessee, but most of it is more like uh, Wyoming, really, Wyoming and, and, and Canada. Um, the uh, Moscow, I, I was in, uh, I lived in four, five cities, major cities in the, uh, in the western part, okay? We always hear about temperatures like 70 below, and that exists in the eastern part in Siberia, but even Russians are not so crazy to go living mostly living over there, you know. 90% of them live in the, uh, the western part, where, you know, like, like us. So um, some of my stories will be about, mostly about where the people and where I was. Um, probably most all of you know about this man, Joseph Stalin. His real name was um, Joseph, um, let's see, Jugashvili. And he wasn't really, he wasn't an ethnic Russian at all. He was actually an ethnic Georgian from the south by the, the Black Sea. Um, at the time of his death in 1953, he, was, he, he ruled probably the, the most people in the entire world. Um, and I, didn't, I did not meet him. Maybe some of my class here think I'm fairly old, but <laughs> I did not get a chance to meet him. He was passed away before I got, you know, came on the scene. However, I did visit his house. And his house, uh, at least this house, was in a very unusual place. It's called uh, Stalin's Bunker in the city of Samara, which is a city of a million and a half people on the southern part, toward the, the middle part of the Volga River. And this is the uh, war room in this, uh, in this bunker that was built uh, in 1941-42 when the Germans were, were right on the doorstep of, uh, of Moscow. They literally could, uh, they got so close with binoculars they could see the spires of the Kremlin. And, and even the Russians were worried that maybe they, could t they would take Moscow. So they moved the government to Samara farther away on the uh, Volga River, and Samar happens to be, unlike uh, Stalingrad, to be on the other side of the river. So they had the river between. And so they had uh, all of their government departments and the embassies, and the American ambassador was there. And amid all, in the center of the city, with all of these diplomats and their spies looking around, the Russians somehow built this giant bunker, the largest one in the world, it goes down 41 meters, that's about 125 feet, and could uh, sustain uh, about 700 people. So this was, uh, yeah, the war room, first uh, place to use uh, uh, radio telephones, for example. This was Stalin's office, and uh, it had windows which is kind of strange for 125 feet below the surface. But they had, uh, they used uh, like a light gray silk to give a kind of a light, a lightish shimmer. So you get a feeling that there was light outside. Uh, you can see that, uh, that, you know, his desk is simple, very simple. In fact, uh, I would say your chairs, are, chairs are definitely have more cushion than his chair. And uh, he was an aesthetic. He was not into having luxury things. I mean, he liked a nice uniform. You'll see him in that. He had tailored unif uniforms, but uh, you, there's nothing, you know, very uh, extraordinary there, ornate there. Um, but there is uh, one thing that is a little odd. There are six doors in this uh, office. Now, again, 125 feet down in a hole, why would you need six doors? 
Well, four of them were fake. Apparently, uh, Joseph Stalin kind of liked to peep, keep visitors uneasy, not knowing from which direction somebody might appear. Well, uh, a Russian historian, Edward Radzinski, Radzinski, said that there was nothing that Stalin did that was funny. <laughs> Stalin was a man who was ruthless. He, uh, he uh, would got rid of his, all his enemies, and he got rid of all the people he even imagined could become his enemies. He uh, personally signed 50,000 death sentences. And here's one of them, where uh, he, in a blue, in a blue uh, uh, pencil, uh, he signed off on a uh, list. Uh, there was 23 uh, people that were uh, for his approval. And what he signed, he says, shoot them all, in his initials. Um, he, he caused a, uh, during the time from 1917 to 1953 at his death, it estimated that 20 million people were either shot or um, starved or worked to death. Um, one time I was uh, uh, in, in Voronezh, a city of about a million people. Uh, one time we took a trip, a short trip out in the countryside just to go uh, you know, to the woods for a picnic. And as we're driving along, somebody said, oh, and pointed, over there, we, they gathered all the professors of the university and shot them. We just found their bones. Kind of a threat, you know, uh, actually. Um, some of the, uh, they had quotas. They actually had quotas. And uh, in some cities, they, uh, you know, in order to meet the quota, particularly for, for, they would get a phone book and look for foreign names and then arrest them. There was one, uh, of one uh, city, they had a conference, a uh, KGB had you know, actually stood up and said, we don't have uh, actually enough uh, enemies of the people in my region, and I, and I personally don't think it's right to arrest people and shoot them uh, based on a quota. <laughs> well, um, three days later, he was arrested and shot. In uh, the Butova prison record, the Butova prison has a record that shows, for example, during uh, 1937 and 38, which is called the, the Great Purge. Just an example, on December 8th, 1937, 474 people shot just at this one prison. Uh, on February 17th, 1938, well, like next week, okay, 502 people shot. On February 28th, 1938, 562 people shot. Um, finally, in November of 1938, Stalin finally called it off. You know, it had, had kind of, it's how it had gotten out of control. Um, but there were still over 3,000 people who had uh, death sentences uh, processed, but had not been executed. They were carried out anyway. This kind of paranoia, uh, atmosphere of paranoia, and, and, and many times I ask myself, well, why, you know, they did this to themselves? Why didn't they, you know, stop this? Well, um, that's, e that's easier said than done, okay? Because basically, once that starts, okay, we get those, and then you say, hey, but that's my friend. Oh, boom, uh, you're gone. And then somebody says, hey, that's not right. Oh, boom. Oh, and your family. Oh, boom. And it's real, you know, it's very easy to get rid of the people who are the most, you know, uh, raise their hand the most. Uh, yeah, students, and, you know, at that time it wasn't good for you to raise your hand with questions, probably. <laughs> we, we uh, right now, we, we very much encourage it. So. But uh, this sort of atmosphere uh, kind of creates a strange uh, kind of mindset environment. So this is in, uh, this is actually in uh, Nizhny Novgorod, where I lived five years. It's the Central Telephone and Telegraph Building. And it's only about a block away from the KGB has headquarters of that city. And that KGB head headquarters is a massive, you know, like a Washington-style massive government building. It's five stories tall, classic and everything. And they say five stories below the surface, too. 
And uh, in five years there, I don't think I ever remember anybody going inside, in or out that front door. Um, but this, uh, this telegraph uh, w uh, office, telephone, this is where, at least until about 89 or 1990, um, it, all the switches were there. And it, particularly if you wanted to make an overseas call, you had to go there and order it in, in advance. Um, it was built by German prisoners of war. So after the war, they actually kept them, I didn't know this, until as late as 1956 and put them to work building things and repairing things from the war. Well, the Russians said they did very good work, okay, very good construction work. Uh, but in this case, they said, oh, those, those, those clever uh, Germans, they got us back. Because they said, uh, if you stand, well, they said, if you stand, you see on the side there's this uh, freeze right there, okay? And they said, oh, if you stand near the KGB headquarters on a certain uh, corner, all right, and look a certain way at the profile of this, it's kind of like a half globe. We're looking at it on, head on, but it's like a half globe. If you look at it at the side profile, you see the profile of Adolf Hitler. <laughs> and I was there, they were doing like, I'm looking. No, like five years, I never saw it. <laughs> but they, they have got it in their head that that's, you know. Now, why could this all happen? How could we have such a, you know, a, a, a naughty, terrible guy like Uncle Joe Stalin, as FDR used to call him, or uh, Lenin? How do you get control and cause all this, this havoc? Well, uh, if you go to St. Petersburg, which is now Leningrad, St. Petersburg, or Moscow, and just take a look around the buildings, you'll get an understanding of why. This is the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, which is my favorite city. Um, it's got a thousand rooms. It is now the Hermitage Museum of Art. It's a world-class art museum, okay? Um, and this is the Winter Palace. That means that there are summer palaces multiple palaces. Everybody gets a palace. Everybody that, uh, the, uh, er, there was an aristocracy and there was everybody else, which was basically a serf and very poor. And I won't show you a picture of the very poor because all you got to do is go to a nearby slum in our country or Detroit and you'll get the idea, okay? But here, uh, well, here's a summer, one of the sun. This is Catherine the Great's summer palace. I went there at least, it wasn't until the second time I went here that I could notice the Rembrandts and other classical paintings of their personal collection on the wall because I couldn't take my eyes off the parquet floors. Here's a parquet floor in not that palace, but a palace of the buddy, a cousin of the Tsar, Yusupov. Yusupov. He was the richest man in Russia at the time of the revolution. This is just one of the parquet floors. They have domes of many different domes in this palace um, and a huge palace up for a family of four. Family of four. This is one of my favorite rooms, a turn of the century billiard table. So if we are standing looking in this way, he had this acoustically designed so that we could hear even a whisper from the other end of that table. This is another of my favorite uh, rooms in that palace. Uh, one of many, several themed rooms, all right, Islamic theme in this case. I had a friend that I met in 1980 in uh, in Leningrad as students and he was studying psychology and he knew one of the guides at this Yusupov Palace. So imagine us after school, imagine yourselves after school, we all get together there and after the museum is closed and we hang out right here, sit on these little benches and bring our special beverages including vodka and, uh, and well I didn't actually leave my initials then. I forgot to leave my initials in there. Okay, um, I mean, the Russians have a joke about, what, about, well, one time there was a donkey that was crossing a desert, very hot and very, it was getting very thirsty, and it suddenly came upon two big barrels. In one barrel was water, and the other barrel was vodka. Which barrel do you think the donkey chose to drink? Well, of course the water. So therefore, let's not be jackasses and let's drink the vodka. <laughs> 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 
after uh, after the war, and uh, you know, there's uh, the, the idea of the bright future was something that has came from uh, really from the beginning, from Lenin, and, and it was during Stalin. He would talk about, all right, we have to suffer, we have to work during the war, we have to work, and the whole idea of the bright future is we are sacrificing. We are doing this work for our children to make, and before it was communism, but it was to make the, the secure world, the happy world, the place that is safe for our families, uh, the bright future. All right, they, the Russians had another uh, name for it. It was called, another word for it is called uh, normalny, normalna, which means normal. And this is where the Russians uh, felt like, well, they just want a normal life, you know, where people have something, they can say what they want, and they can have a nice home, and they can have a, a nice family, which they, they, they themselves have never, uh, never experienced. But they thought other people have this, this sort of thing. And sometimes we, you know, we do, or we, although we can sort of argue about that sometimes. All right, but that was the idea. We're going to, we're building, we're working, we're saving, we're, we're not go doing without because it's for the bright future, the Sietli Budishi, they say, the bright future. And uh, Khrushchev well, came in and, and liberalized and, you know, people could, for a time, speak freer and, you know, Stalin was, you know, put to the side, actually moved out of the, ma the, mausole the uh, mausoleum, all right, and, uh, well, as a Hoosier, as a native Hoosier, he must be a good guy to be so enthusiastic about corn. <laughs> And uh, many people probably don't know, or maybe, maybe, don't know that the first two men in space to orbit the Earth were Russians. Okay, if you would Google first two men in space here on American computer, you'll get all about John Glenn and, and Scott Carpenter and, and other ones. And for some, but the first two actually to, and in fact, uh, 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 Yuri Gagarin was the first and German Titov was the second. They had already gone around 17 times, spent a whole day in space before uh, John Glenn could get around three times. All right, so they were very proud, they were very, in reason to be proud, they were the pioneers of the space race. Um, then it stepped back again. You know, we went into Vietnam and, you know, it's sort of like every, you know, a, two steps forward and then another step back. And here comes Brezhnev. He said, it's getting too free. And so they called that now the great stagnation. When things were safe, things were under control, nobody, you know, going to dissent too much and, uh, and kind of boring. And people drank a lot. And, uh, and Brezhnev actually, it was, uh, you know, he, he was a smoker, and he actually died of uh, throat cancer. Um, uh, th but <laughs> one time his, uh, his translator, his foreign language translator, um, wrote that uh, one time after he gave up, you know, when he started having a little problem with his throat, he gave up smoking. Uh, so one time they were waiting for, uh, like the Prime Minister of East uh, Germany, uh, waiting for him to, to come into the conference room. And uh, the translator was smoking a cigarette, and Brezhnev is looking at that very longingly. And finally he says to his translator, well, blow some smoke, you know, in my face here. Because he didn't want to, you know, go back to smoking. Uh, and of course the translator did what his boss said, and he started, he was blowing smoke into his face, and in walks the German prime minister. <laughs> At that time, we managed to uh, acquire um, up, we acquired 30,000. The United States uh, made 30,000 uh, nuclear weapons. And the Russians, of course, did the same. At one point in 1946, when we, only we had the atomic bomb, an atomic bomb, not a hydrogen bomb, um, our, our Pentagon uh, strategized, calculated, it would take 200 atomic bombs to completely uh, defeat the Soviet Union, okay. Um, actually, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, who was head of our Los Alamos team that, that discovered the atomic bomb, actually suggests, he said, let's not get into, he saw the destructiveness of an arms race, he said, let's give them the formula, okay. They won't follow it anyway because they'll think that we gave them the wrong formula and they'll blow themselves up. But at least we'll, uh, we'll <laughs> you know, on peace. Well, of course, that was rejected. All right. This is uh, called the Tsar bomb. It's the largest that was ever uh, made and uh, I mean this so each one of these 30,000 
They have 30,000, we have 30,000. I know that we have, um, you know, we've set, we've reduced, but I have a feeling it's kind of stored away, you know. Um, each one of these is enough to, to absolutely destroy and fry all of us in Campbell County in a split second. All right, in fact, it can do the same for New York City and for Washington, D.C. Right, each one of the 30,000. Um, we have enough, between us, we have enough to kill the whole world seven times. And we still have this, this, this sort of thing. Um, Andrei Sakharov was the head of their team that discovered their uh, atomic bomb and, and hydrogen bomb. And later he became a dissident and he spoke out against this arms race. He said it was futile, it's ridiculous. And he spoke in favor of freedom, personal freedoms, not only in Russia, but for you know, other world uh, countries. Uh, he was exiled from Moscow and people thought, you know, oh, it's a Siberia. But actually it was in Nizhny Novgorod where I lived. And I actually lived in the same complex as his apartment. And his apartment is there and is, is a museum now. You can go to it. It's a, on the first floor, uh, it's a, like a small two bedroom. It had, was furnished as all the Soviet apartments. It came, comes with furniture. When I was selling houses, they'd even say, well, where's my furniture? You know, when I was selling the house, well, what? Um, but he, uh, so he lived on the first floor. They had a 24-hour uh, police box outside to monitor anybody that would go in or out. That's the sort of life even a world-class person at times had to, to suffer. <clears throat> There's a joke, a uh, Russian joke about Reagan that uh, a guy goes into a dark alley and he gets held up by a robber. And the guy's holding a gun and says, put your hands up. Are you for Carter or Reagan? And the victim says, shoot me. <laughs> a lot of people that I hear that Reagan won the Cold War, okay, that uh, because he ramped up our, our defense spending too hugely that the Russians realized they couldn't keep up and therefore they surrendered. They gave, you know, gave up and surrendered, okay. Um, after of what I've already showed you, okay, about what they have endured and what they have done, can you possibly believe that? Can you possibly believe that they would surrender to anybody about their own place, their own land? I mean, I, I, I really think that probably you, uh, us in Wyoming, can, can, if the shoe was on the other foot, would it matter uh, that they would, uh, anything they would do as to us, you know, giving up our rights? Would you fight, you know, would they fought to the end? Why would that be any different for us? Why would we imagine that a cowboy, actually an actor of a cowboy, could actually threaten them? I mean, they're used, to, they defeated Napoleon. They defeated Hitler at immense cost. 27 million people killed during World War II. And the cowboy says, I won? Oh, please. It's a myth. It's a complete myth. Perhaps. Mr. Gorbachev deserves more credit. Perhaps they sort of said, you know what? This is really crazy having enough weapons to kill everybody seven times and spending all this money. Why don't we just work on our own country where we have everything and do something about that? Maybe that's what they did. And they started to do that. This is a Boris Yeltsin on a tank. In, uh, on August 18, 1991, he was uh, trying to force back a coup uh, and those are bodyguards around him. Some of those people I worked with are around the fringes in an economics institute. And he was in front of the, in Moscow, uh, and they turned back. These were ex-KGB uh, officers that tried to make a coup, and that was turned back. And so they started, they started this era of reforms in, in uh, the 90s, which was great for people suddenly could speak freely. And when I was there in the 80s, nobody smiled, okay? But in, you know, since then, People smile, they can talk, okay? They can't necessarily do anything, but they can talk about everything. Now, unfortunately, when trying to shift over from a centralized system to a market something system, uh, there's a lot of moving parts, and it was a disaster. Uh, factories that had been uh, hiring all kinds of workers, making all kinds of things. I had, in Nizhny Novgorod, there was a factory with 6,000 workers making uh, uh, television sets, electronics, particularly television sets. But once the market was open, everybody went to buy a Sony and nobody wanted a six button television set anymore. Everyone lost their job. Everything, you know, caved in. Um, 
and this went, created a, a hyperinflation. A hyperinflation of the, the parents of my girlfriend uh, actually has saved 10 years to buy a new car. And after this hyperinflation, before they could get their money back from the bank, well, they just took it, all of it, and bought a jean jacket for her. But they did get a McDonald's, the largest McDonald's in the world, 30 <laughs> cashiers. People would let sit, would stand in line, even in a cold like this. I was in that line many a times. And uh, it was so different that people would dress up and take their dates. That was a date to go to McDonald's. <laughs> I want to tell you about just a couple of people that, uh, that men, Russian men, that were real men. This is Andrei Andreevich Kozlov. I worked with him briefly. Um, when he was out of, out of politically uh, kind of set aside temporarily, he was number two man at the central bank. And he, uh, when he was out working, when I was working with him, he was out of power and uh, he planned what he would do, the reforms, he never gave up. And then when Putin came in, he actually reappointed him and he started his reforms. He instituted the first deposit insurance for their banks. For them it was only a start, $3,000. But I had seen panics in 1994 Five, when people were banging, breaking the doors of the bank, desperately trying to get their money back. So insurance, he uh, encouraged consumer lending, lending not just to the big factories, but people to buy a car, to get a, an apartment. Uh, he also tightened uh, the supervision, the rules for the banks, because most of their banks actually were money launderers. They could be la money laundering kidnap money, uh, and some did. Unfortunately, some of those money launderers didn't like what he was doing. So, and one day when he came out of a soccer facility after playing a, war, you know, a pickup game with uh, central bank employees, uh, two assassins came out of the woods and shot him in the neck, in the throat, and one in the head, and killed his uh, <coughs> driver also. This is Boris Namsov, he less than a year ago, he also was killed by assassins right on the bridge next to the Kremlin. He, I worked with him briefly in Nizhny Novgorod. He was the governor, the youngest governor in the whole uh, country and tremendous uh, uh, proponent of, of, of the new freedoms, of rights. Then when Putin came in, he became an out. He joined the uh, opposition party and he kept uh, at this and at demonstrations. And uh, well, he is a world-class, he and Mr. And Mr. Kozlov were world-class people people who could have worked anywhere in the world, who probably, I, I believe they had offers from Harvard to teach there, but they chose to stay in Russia and work for the change of their country, and they paid the full cost. And there are demonstrations, this is a demonstration after his murder, and they will demonstrate until they get the true, the normalna, a real, a, the, the svetli budashi, the bright future that they have finally deserve. And let me tell you why. There is no possibility, really, that we're ever, despite the news, going to go to war with Russia. This is the pipeline system uh, in Europe. As you see, uh, half of the natural gas and plenty of oil goes on these pipelines from Russia to Western Europe, basically heating uh, the cold winter in Western Europe. Now, what sense would it be to attack the person who's heating your home? Makes no sense at all. And it isn't going to happen. This is uh, Ukraine. Ukraine doesn't have so much oil and gas, but they're the transit point. So it makes no sense also to blow up your transit points for your heating system. It's not going to happen. All this other is something else. Oops. This is a map of the U.S. bases that are close to the Russian border uh, all around, which are, uh, supposedly Russia is threatening. Now, now, I don't have a na another map for the Russian bases because there's none around the United States. So it's kind of wonder, you know, who's threatening who? Uh, I like this picture because um, this is a, a, you know, when, when our president talks to us, usually from the Oval Office, and he looks right in the camera and he you know, appeals to us. This is a normal picture for the Russian president. Vladimir Putin is on the left there, in case you didn't know. And uh, so they always usually, show them working and fixing problems. And some minister is there and, you know, he's staring very intently at them, you know, and they're reporting how they're, you know, working out all the problems. You know, once, once in a while, he does have a, a, a free a radio uh, call in once a year, I think, where he takes any question. Anyway, he do, but, but this is the usual Russian uh, 
approach for uh, communicating their, that they're doing everything they can. Now, Mr. Putin is, uh, he's an ex-KGB guy. He is not a Stalin, all right? He, in fact, said that, um, that anybody that doesn't regret the passing of the Soviet Union has no heart. But anybody that wants to go back to it has no brains. So he is, uh, you know, he, he is a, a reformer, but uh, he's also, you know, ex-KGB officer. He and his cronies are all uh, also ex-KGB officers. They all uh, basically scare the big GBs out of everybody because they can do anything they're above the law. I'll never forget the first time, well, when he was first appointed, came into the administration, I was in Samara, and I told my friends in the U.S., I said, be careful what you, when you send me an email, what you say in there. And like, you know, almost immediately I get this email and in the uh, subject line it said, in, in capital letters, secret, secret, secret. <laughs> Three days later, uh, when I was away from the office, I came, I came back and uh, my secretary had the giant, biggest, scary eyes that I had ever seen. A KGB officer had come visiting purposely when I was gone and said to her, hmm, you seem to be reporting to everybody but us. We are, this is just a, you know, the Svetli Burushi, the, the, uh, the bright future. The, the Russians have so long worked and endured and uh, for this, and they're still struggling in their own country to have the freedoms that we take for granted. And at the same time, I have to look around since I came back as to what's happening here. I mean, I, I feel so, you know, af afraid all the time from uh, what is happening. You know, I'm supposedly under threat from, from terrorists who started with uh, box cutters, okay? After I had been in, in the, in the uh, country, that was the, is the only country that actually has weapons that could kill us. And they are our friends. They are not, they are not threatening us. And yet we have somehow, despite uh, the, the, the lack of any legitimate uh, possible killer, have maintained the same costs as if that person, that, that, that country was there for box cutters and people with pistols in Paris. We are spending uh, $1.3 trillion as an economist one per year on protecting ourselves now, even though the only country that could possibly kill us is our friend, and in fact, warming all our houses in Europe. So, well, one time uh, I was uh, uh, in a taxi, I was uh, taking a taxi, and I talked to the taxi driver. I asked him uh, you know, how, how he was doing, and he said, well, I'm over 40 years old, and I, you know, I got a degree in engineering, but uh, the factory, I worked for this factory for 20 years, but uh, you know, with all the things, uh, it, it couldn't get budget money, and it couldn't sell its products, so it went out of business, and I lost my job and we had to sell some stuff to keep going, uh, our personal stuff. And now I'm driving a taxi um, to, you know, to keep things going. And I, and I said to him, you know, isn't it hard to think about the past? And he said, uh, well, that's the past. But I still have my hands. And I think if we can get over our past story and think about what we could do, you know, uh, I'm going to say, you know, something maybe that some people may not expect, but we already have a, a, a defense budget, 1.3 trillion, which is several times over, it's more than all the others in the, in, the, in the world. Even if we cut it in half, we'd still have more than all of our enemies. So just imagine this. Suppose we took less than half. That would be $500 billion and spend it for improving our lives and do that every year as an investment instead of throwing away planes and rockets and tanks. What would that change for us and our happiness? What would that do about our behavior toward the rest of the world and their behavior toward us? I have to say that, you know, if we think about it, the bright new future, the Svetli Budashi, is right in front of us.